let's dive into some questions. I'll begin with the word of prayer, and then we'll take a look at some of the questions that you all have submitted. Father, thank you for this time we can share together this evening, and we just want it all to be glorifying to you. And we thank you that you have uh, told us some things in advance in your word so that we might be ready. And so, Lord, we pray that we would just continue to grow and learn. And uh, Lord, as we share together these questions, uh, we look to you and your word for the answers. And we love you and praise you together in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. All right, so what I'll do is I'll take a couple that were texting him previously, and then uh, I'll throw it uh, over to Tyler, and he'll, he'll give me some questions that you're texting in now. By the way, somebody uh, asked, because I referenced a Johnny Cash song um, in Revelation 22. The song is called The Man Comes Around. So download it. It's a, it's a fun song. The Man Comes Around. All right. Uh, will the gospel be preached slash shared to every person, people group on earth before the rapture? And actually, they're referring to, in uh, Matthew chapter 24, it says, um, verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. And I think in the chronology of events, yes, it's talking about that happening before the rapture, before the, the church is seized and taken up to heaven. When it says that the gospel will be preached to all uh, all nations, the, the Greek word is ethnos, and it literally means every ethnic slash language group. So it doesn't just mean nations by borders, it means uh, languages, ethnic groups speaking different languages. There are presently about 7,000 different languages in the world today. And I was uh, having dinner actually at Museum of the Bible uh, about a year and a half ago and sat next to Mart Green, uh, whose father founded Hobby Lobby, the Green family. And Mart is actually spearheading an effort, you can see it at the Museum of the Bible, to get the Bible translated into every language. And um, of the 7,000, approximately 7,000 languages on the planet right now, about 2,500 languages do not have the Bible. And so um, Mart is a part of a ministry called Every Tribe, Every Nation. And based on their ability to put Scripture into publication in various languages and or digitize it, because now we have technology, um, they believe, they estimate that by 2033, um, the Bible will be in every language. So, um, you know, I, I'm not putting a date on it, I'm just saying that uh, we're living in a day when this is actually happening to advance the gospel in every ethnic, ling linguistic um, uh, nation in that sense. Um, and then someone asked, if all things are new in the, heaven, in the new heaven and earth, will we still know our earthly family and loved ones? And yes, and I draw this out of the fact that Jesus in His glorified body was, was recognized by His disciples. Even His disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration recognized Moses and Elijah, though they had never met them before. So, th there indicates in Scripture that there's a familiarity and, you know, now we know, Paul says, now we know in part in 1 Corinthians 13, but then we shall know fully even as we're fully known. So, yes, we will certainly be able to recognize our loved ones um, in heaven. Uh, but then someone else asked, um, I, I want to make sure I understand what you said. If I have an, an unsaved loved one, daughter or son, I will have no memory of them in heaven. So, again, the implication there is an unsaved loved one, um, who doesn't make it to heaven, will we know who is absent? And uh, the answer that I gave is based out of Revelation 21, 4, which says, and God, talking about the new heaven, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, nor sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And so, I, I have to believe when you read a verse like that, that any memory that would be painful or cause one sorrow or crying um, will be erased. Uh, as I said when I was teaching through chapter 21 of Revelation, that memory is a wonderful thing, but memory is also a haunting thing. Uh, there are some things, I'm sure we could all agree, that we wish we could forget, even in this lifetime. Stuff you've done, uh, scenes that you have you know, had to look at or, or things that you've encountered in your life that you think, I wish I'd never heard that, learned that, seen that. 
And so sometimes memory can be a tormenting thing. And so I think God in his grace will not allow us to remember things. That part will be erased. That might be painful. So no, I, I don't think that we will know who is missing. I think we're going to be too um, just caught up in the wonder and the beauty and the glory of God that, that everything else will just um, fade away that is too sorrowful or, or too painful. All right, that's a few from what was texted in earlier. Tyler, what do you have there? All right. Uh, Revelation 21, 1, uh, one of the saddest verses in Revelation says that there will no longer be any sea. Yeah. Why? That's just, that's what God has determined. I don't Aren't seas and that. oceans a beautiful part of God's creation? Yeah, I know. And for all of you beach bums, uh, you are bummed. Um, <laughs> But, you know, there's no more sea. I mean, right now on the planet, the planet is covered about 74% uh, in water, um, but it's, it's, um, it's a dry new earth for the most part, except for the river of life that goes through the new Jerusalem. Hmm. Hmm. All right. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. No more need, you know, other benefits too. No more need for sunscreen. No more skin cancer. Anyway, go ahead. No. What else do you have? Where is America in Revelation? So that's a great question. And that, somebody else um, texted that in earlier in the week. There is, there's really no reference to America in, in the Bible, um, uh, particularly in the book of Revelation. Now, there is... Um, a veiled reference in the book of Ezekiel. Um, in, in Ezekiel, and, and, I'll, and I'll, after I give you the reference here and why I say it's a veiled reference, I, I will specifically answer the question. But um, there's a veiled reference in Ezekiel chapter 38. As you get close to the end times, the, there's going to be a battle that precedes the battle of Armageddon when nations converge against Israel. I think it, I think th that uh, conglomeration of nations ends up being also a, a block of nations that you're going to see again emerge in the Battle of Armageddon. But Ezekiel 38 is distinct from Armageddon, but somewhat related in that the nations are very similar. But when you look at the list of nations that come against Israel just, just prior to, to the um, end of the age, um, there's a whole list of European and Northern African nations that uh, converge and Russia that converge against Israel. Um, among the nations, though, that question what's going, why are these nations coming against Israel are, this is Ezekiel 38, 13, Sheba, Dedan. Okay, those are references to Saudi Arabia. It's interesting. Why would Saudi Arabia, but, you know, presently Saudi Arabia is an ally. So uh, Sheba, Sheba and Dedan, and listen to this, and the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions, that's an interesting phrase, will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take, to take uh, booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away uh, livestock and goods, to take great plunder? So these nations, Saudi Arabia and the United, uh, uh, could be a reference to the United States, will question why are these nations coming against Israel? Now, I say it's a veiled reference because tar it mentions Tarshish and all their young lions. So um, Tarshish, Herodotus said that uh, Tarshish was located beyond the pillars of Hercules. I have these, this notation in the, in the margin of my Bible. The pillars of Hercules were Gibraltar and past Gibraltar you have England. So Herodotus identified and some other historians identified Tarshish as England. And what is the national motto of uh, the symbol for England? It's a lion. And when it says here that Tarshish and all their young lions will question what is happening here, um, some Bible scholars say, okay, this is potentially a reference to the, the young lions being the colonies that came out of England. So the United States might be included in, in that. And so that would be the only possible reference to since seeing as how we used to be a colony of England until the Revolutionary War. That may be the only reference in the Bible to the United States. Why is there an absence um, of the reference to the U.S. in the Bible, and particularly in, in the end times? And I think the answer could be because um, we will basically become a 
certainly a less powerful nation after the rapture. When the rapture happens and Christians are removed from not just the planet, but specifically in our conversation here, from the United States, you're, you're going you're gonna to see a nation that has gone from a powerhouse to basically a, a crippled shell. Now, that isn't to suggest that the majority of Americans are going to get raptured. I'm just saying that there are a large number, I don't know the exact number, of evangelical born-again Christians in the United States. And when, when we are gone, you know, what does our country look like? Uh, how does that affect um, government? How does that affect our military? How does that affect, you know, um, industry? And so, um, I think that that might be the only plausible reason why you don't really see a reference to the United States, because I think after the rapture, we're, we're pretty much rendered a, a very insignificant country at that point. Uh, here's another one. <clears throat> why do you believe the rapture is pre-trib? And I, I mean that pre-tribulation. Yeah. Um, well, the Bible says in uh, 1 Thessalonians, I think it's 1 Thessalonians 5, um, that we are not appointed unto wrath, um, but to receive salvation. Um, and so when you look at the context of Scripture, um, it, it, I think, now again, this is, this is one of these great debated questions, and I think that there are good Bible-believing believe, Christians on all sides of the argument, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib. I just happen to think that when you look at the overall evidence of Scripture um, that the church is gone before the tribulation. One of the main things I look at in the book of Revelation is when you look at the last reference to the word church, um, it's, it's at the end of uh, chapter 3, and then you have this trumpet sound, um, and John is called up, and from that point forward, then you, you don't see a mention of the church and until you get to the end of the book of Revelation. So um, the church is absent during the heart of the tribulation, which is chapter 6 through 18. And, and so I, I could go on, but that, it's going to be a lengthy answer to, to that. But um, I think that when you see the absence of the church starting at Revelation chapter 4, uh, until it reappears at the end of the book of Revelation, that that's probably the greatest evidence why I don't think the church is here during the tribulation period. So I'm, I'm a pre-tribber. You know, my flesh wants to be a pre-tribber anyway. It's like, who, who really wants to be around for, for the tribulation? But, but mm -hmm. honestly, I think it's, uh, it's scripture that shapes that. And, and I'm going to ask Dr. Heinsohn next week to explain it even further. Because he's a big pre-tribber. <laughs> Tribber. And what translation were you reading where it said booty? New King James. Okay. Don't be distracted. I got distracted on that. Sorry. Yeah, I know. Else when I that? came to it, I thought, oh, great. But I had to read it anyway. Oh, you, it's you, all the word of you, God. It's you all hesitated. good. It's all good. Don't, oh, the flesh in you. All right. Uh, yeah, I hesitated because I knew you were sitting next to me. <laughs> okay. Um, what is the purpose of the millennial kingdom? Um, so it's a thousand year reign of Christ on earth. You, you mean, somebody's probably asking from the standpoint of why don't we just go from, you know, the rapture to eternity? Why mm -hmm. even have the millennial period? Um, you know, some of these things we, we don't necessarily figure out. We just take it face value and God has determined that there's going to be this thousand year period where Jesus comes and establishes his reign on the earth for a thousand years, that believers will rule and reign with him. Um, you know, it's, um, it's a time perhaps, and this is just pure speculation, it's a time perhaps when finally um, the earth is going to be ruled by a loving, beneficent um, Messiah King and in a way that we've never experienced on earth. You know, right now we have all these divisions and political strife and wars and rumors of wars and Finally, there's going to be one king over all the earth who rules as the Prince of Peace. So in that sense, it's almost like, you know, God saying, here's a refreshing look at the way it should happen. So it's going to be for a thousand years and then a new heaven and a new earth. 
Uh, let, me, let me try to take one from what people um, submitted earlier in the week. In heaven slash new heaven and new earth, will we see both Jesus and God? Isn't Jesus the fleshly image of God? Yeah, true, but I think that we will see both. I mean, Hebrews 1, 3 says that the Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. So, the presence of God in all of His fullness, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, will be present. And, um, and the glory of God will be visible. Uh, God in the image of uh, Jesus, of course, will be visible, will be present. The Holy Spirit will be present. So, I think that we will behold um, all of God in his, in his glory. Because again, you know, Paul, Paul would write that in 1 Corinthians 13 uh, also, you know, uh, now we see, but in a glass darkly, in a foggy mirror, but then we shall see face to face. And so there is this, you know, wonderful expect, expectation of seeing the Lord in, in, in person. Um, somebody asked, who is living outside the new Jerusalem city? And somebody else kind of goes with that. What is the need for city walls of the new Jerusalem? So in Revelation chapter uh, 22, this person is probably asking this question because at the end of Revelation 22, uh, verse 15, um, well, verse 14 says, blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside, outside the city are dogs, we talked about that last week, meaning those who are uh, uh, morally impure, uh, and sorcerers, and sexually immoral, and murderers, and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. So then the question here is, you know, why is it mentioning there are people outside the city? Who would those people be? This is really just a reference to those who have already been cast into the lake of fire. Remember, the lake of fire is eternal punishment. There's no such thing as annihilation. It's not, you know, people have this false understanding, and I even heard the, the Pope talk about how uh, hell was just a place that people experienced annihilation. That's not true. That's not what the Bible says, that uh, the lake of fire is a place of perpetual suffering and um, where, where, where it's never quenched. And so, this is a reference to those who are outside the city because they've already been cast into the lake of fire. The question with that is, what's the need for city walls of the New Jerusalem? I mean, if you, if you don't have anybody to keep out and nobody is being restricted in, I mean, who would want to leave anyway? You're in the presence of Jesus and it's a wonderful life. Um, why do you even need walls? Um, and, and I think the answer just is because, you know, sometimes walls are not to keep people in or keep people out. Sometimes walls are just for beautification and boundaries. And when you read chapter 21 of Revelation and you see the beautiful layers, we talked about this, of, of different precious gems that make up the foundation of these city walls, it's just part of the beautification of the city. And the gates being of a, each gate, 12 gates, being of a single pearl, um, it's just is beautiful imagery of a beautiful city, uh, and the gates aren't ever going to be shut. There's nobody to keep out. This is, this is the new heaven and the new earth. This is eternity, and it's just going to be a wonderful place to, to live, but I think that would probably be the only explanation. Uh, someone else asked, do the 144,000 Jews preach only in Israel or all over the world? Um, so, the 144,000 are mentioned in two places in Revelation. They're mentioned in chapter 7. Uh, from the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, and then they're mentioned again in chapter 14. And um, these are basically, these 144,000 Jews are believers in Yeshua and Jesus as Messiah, and God will use them as evangelists in the earth during the time of the tribulation period. So, the question is, are they only going to be there in, in Israel, or, um, or are they preaching all over the world? I've never gotten this question before. It caused me to have to look carefully. But in chapter 14 of Revelation, uh, it says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion. So, we know this is Jerusalem. And with him, 144,000. So, in chapter 14 of Revelation, it tells us exactly where they're going to be located. Uh, they're in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. And among the description of the 144,000, it says further down in Revelation 14, verse um, four says, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. And these are the ones, listen, who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And so, their mission was, um, you know, to always uh, um, be directed by the Lord uh, as to where they should go. But 
John sees this vision um, looking in advance, because chapter 14 is kind of out of context in the flow of the chronology. But it, it seems to indicate that they're pretty much located there in Jerusalem and Israel. That said, with technology now the way it is, wherever they're located, I'm sure their message will be broadcast around the world. So they won't be restricted there, maybe just physically, but certainly not their message. You got something else for me there, partner? Yeah, I'm going to recommend a book if I can. The Bible? No. Nope. Uh, oh. No. All right. Speaking of Ed Heinsohn, um, I'd recommend this book. He wrote it along with two other authors, Mark Hitchcock and Tim LaHaye, if you recognize that name, it's because he wrote Left Behind. Um, but it's called The Harvest Handbook of Bible Prophecy, and I'd highly recommend it. It's been an awesome resource for me, um, and I know it would be for you as well. It's Revelation. It's everything to do with prophecy in all the Bible. But again, it's called The Harvest Handbook of Bible Prophecy. Um, and so it's very, very helpful. I would recommend that. Here's a question. Um, if God is among us and we will dwell with him, why a new heaven and a new earth? Two places? You know, again, this is, this is just some stuff we defer to the prerogative of God. I mean, could he have just decided there's only going to be a heaven and we would then all just spend eternity there? You know, he chose that he, to recreate, um, again, out of nothing, to destroy the present heavens, to destroy the present earth. I think in some ways, because, you know, it's not, it's not a makeover. This is not a redo. This is a completely new earth and a new heaven. Uh, the old order of things has passed away. And I think that God just completely wants to start afresh because ever since sin entered the human race and therefore not only tainted humanity, but really tainted the earth, um, that God just wants a complete new start. So, you know, he just determined a new earth. And then John sees uh, the city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. So um, then this new heaven, this new city is located on earth. So, you know, we have that phrase like heaven on earth. It will literally be that, it seems, the way that John is describing it. And it is just the merging of these two things. You know, now the dwelling of God is with men, the Bible talks about in the future. You know, presently, even though theologically God is everywhere because he's omnipresent. But, you know, when we think about the distinctions of humanity dwells on earth, God dwells in heaven, but this is going to be a day when those merge and God will live among us and walk among us. And so it's the merging of heaven on earth. No distinctions now, God there, humanity here. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be him walking among us and dwelling among us. Yeah, I think it'll be full circle like it was in the Garden That's of Eden. That's right. Yeah. If you know the Garden of Eden in Genesis 1 through 3, it literally was God walking with Adam and Eve. So it was heaven on earth in that. And then when sin came in, it separated. But it's very interesting um, the way it all goes back to Eden. And you see a lot of Eden imagery and um, typology in Revelation for the new heaven and new earth. It, it, it comes back. Um, so that's another good question. Yeah. Where, where was Eden? Because Iraq. No, Eden was in Iraq. I mean, at least the way that our t topography is now, because the flood may have, you know, changed things significantly, but there are four rivers that were the headwaters that were located in the Garden of Eden. The Tigris, it mentions Tigris, Euphrates, Pishon, and Gihon. Well, we don't know where the Pishon and Gihon rivers are today. Since the flood, after the flood, there's no reference to it. We know where the Tigris and Euphrates are, and they merge in Iraq. Um, and so... If, in fact, the present Tigris and Euphrates, after the flood, were the same as the Tigris and Euphrates pre-flood, okay, we don't know, then it would put the Garden of Eden somewhere in Iraq. You know, Iraq is significant in the Bible. I mean, Nineveh was in Iraq. Um, Babylon is in Iraq. And so uh, Babylon is the second most mentioned city outside of Jerusalem in the Bible. So Iraq has a significant um, mention in, in the Bible. I want to circle back real quick to the topic of the rapture because I was looking for, where's my notations in my Bible? Um, the word church is found in the book of Revelation 19 times in the first three chapters. And then in chapter four, 
John writes, after these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. And so God then by a spirit takes John up to heaven. There's a trumpet sound. It's very similar to what Paul writes about at the last uh, trumpet call of God will, will sound and First uh, Thessalonians 4, I'll take you there in a minute. And so John then is kept, and it's a picture of the church being kept in heaven while the tribulation happens on earth, chapter 6 through 18. And so um, the word church appears 19 times in the first three chapters of Revelation, and then we don't see the word again until chapter 22, verse 16, the very last chapter of the book. But somebody asked, um, in the study of Revelation, you used a timeline chart to illustrate the contact, content of the book, including the rapture quote, where in Revelation is the rapture referenced? Also, why do you suppose Jesus did not discuss the rapture in Matthew chapter 24? Okay, first, the word rapture is not mentioned in the, in the book of Revelation, and the word rapture is not found anywhere in the Bible. But that's okay, the word Trinity is not found anywhere in the Bible either, but yet we understand the doctrine of the Trinity, and we need to understand the doctrine of the rapture. And so, I've mentioned this many times, but because I keep getting this question, let me just quickly, as best I can quickly, answer from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, the Bible makes mention of this event uh, in uh, verses 13 to 18. This is what Paul writes, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus, those who have gone to heaven. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, very similar to Revelation 4. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And so, this is the reason it's comforting. There's a generation that does not experience death. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, we shall not all perish, but we will all be changed in an instant in the twinkling of an eye that there will be a generation of Christians at whatever point God decides to do this who will be physically snatched from the earth. That's the doctrine of the rapture. Now, since the word doesn't appear in the Bible, then why do we say the word rapture? Because the verses I just read says that we who are alive and remain will be caught up. And in the Greek language of the New Testament, it's the word harpazo. But when the New Testament was written in Latin, the Latin Vulgate, it was the word raptus for the words caught up or seized. And raptus is where we get our English word rapture. So it's this idea that there's going to come a time when, when God rescues the church and calls us heavenward and takes us, physically snatches us, talk about body snatchers, I mean takes us from the earth to rescue us. And again, because I hold to a pre-tribulation view of the Bible, I believe he does this to spare us the coming wrath, that he doesn't want us to suffer. And so he does this to take us away from the earth. You know, look, he rescued Noah and Noah's family before judgment came upon the earth in the form of a flood. He rescued Lot and Lot's family before judgment came upon Sodom and Gomorrah. You see it consistently. It doesn't mean that God rescues us from all tribulation, small t. Because Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. We still go through painful things and trials. But we will be rescued from tribulation, capital T, what is coming upon the earth, Revelation 6 to 18. Now, by the way, the rest of the question was, why didn't Jesus mention this in Matthew 24? He actually does refer to it in Matthew chapter 24, um, verses um, 36 to 44, this is what he says, Matthew 24, 36, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the son of man. 
For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the son of man. Listen to this. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would have come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man, Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not expect. So he, that is a reference, uh, I believe, to, to the rapture, where one man is taken, the other one left. One woman is taken, the other one left. The ones who are taken are believers. So that's why we have to be ready because that part of his return could happen at any time. The trumpet call of God could sound and uh, the dead in Christ rise first. In other words, even though someone has gone to heaven, their spirit has gone to heaven, but their body has decomposed in the earth. But there in, in 1 Thessalonians 4, it says the dead in Christ will rise first. Wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. Are, are they in their graves or are they in heaven? Well, their spirit is in heaven, but their body, they've, they've detached and their body is in the ground. And every, every soul in heaven needs a glorified body like what Jesus has. So one of the first things that happens at the rapture is the saints who have already gone before us, whose souls are in heaven, will get their glorified body that rises from the grave to then be reunited with their spirit. And then it says, and we who are alive and remain at that time when the trumpet call sounds, we get our glorified body on the way up in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. And so we shall be with the Lord forever. And that's why he says, encourage one another with these words. It wouldn't be very encouraging if you have to go through the tribulation. So it's another reason why I think that the preponderance of Scripture points to the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Why would it be encouraging? Oh, Jesus is going to come for his, for his bride. Oh, but not, after, not until you've gone through all these things all the tribulation. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That's not very encouraging. So when he says encourage one another with these words, he's saying it because it's the hope of the church. He's going to come for us and he's going to take us from this earth. Tyler? Someone asks that, um, I often hear it taught that there is nothing that must happen regarding prophecy between now and the rapture. If the gospel has to be preached to all ethnicities that Jesus says before the rapture, wouldn't that be something that must happen first, which hasn't happened yet? Well, true, but um, at what point is all ethnic groups going to be reached in relation to, you know, look, there's nothing in the Bible that tells us that when the church gets raptured, that the tribulation starts immediately. It doesn't say that. Again, a pre-trib view that I hold says that the church is taken before the rapture, but that could be an hour before, a week before, a year before, 10 years before, 20 years before. The Bible does not say when in relation to the removal of the church will the events of the tribulation starting in Revelation 6 start to happen. Therefore, it's possible still that there is, because I do believe that there's nothing in Scripture that says that 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 has to be fulfilled before the trumpet call of taking the church out. But the gospel can still be completed so that people can still hear it in every language, in every tongue, before Jesus comes to earth, you know, during the tribulation. People can get saved during the tribulation. I guarantee you there's going to be some people who are lukewarm, who have been exposed to the truth, and who will not get raptured because they don't have a relationship with Jesus, who then will get serious and have a relationship with Jesus. And some of those very people might, might finish digitizing some of the languages that are necessary for the Bible. There's, there's a, a friend that I've grown to um, know and love in, in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, and he's, he's not a believer. He's Jewish, and he's, you know, told me in no uncertain terms. He's like, you know, I'm not a believer. I don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. I believe he was a great teacher. I believe that he was a, a, a man who worked miracles. I just don't believe that he was the Messiah. And I say to him, are you still looking for Messiah? He says, yeah, I'm still looking for Messiah. And, uh, and he says, but if, but he says kind of jokingly, but I know he's true. He goes, but if, if I never see that one, I'm going to go with yours. <laughs> 
And, I, and, and so I, I think of a guy like him, his name is Moisha. I think of Moisha because I think, you know, when the church gets raptured and then st things start to get crazy, if it happens in our lifetime, Moisha is going to be like, I'm going to go with that guy's Jesus. This is the real one. Because people are going to be, sh people, there are enough people who have enough information that, you know, they're, uh, uh, you know, they can harm themselves with a little bit of information, but they have just enough that when these events begin to happen, they're going to be, ah, it's going to be one of those aha moments. Hmm. Yep. Here's a good one. Uh, confused as to why we will offer sacrifices during the millennium, and that's found in Ezekiel, mm -hmm. when we'll be with Jesus and can just thank him personally. Yeah. It's a well, good question. Well, it it, that will be part of thanking him personally. It will be, those will be uh, sacrifices of worship. Yeah, they it, mention it's a, yeah, like a thank it's, you it's sacrifice. Exactly. It's not going to be sacrifices of atonement. And you have to remember that in the Old Testament, when the sacrificial system was in place, they were sacrificing animals looking forward to the time, um, whether they accept them or not is another matter. But they were, those sacrifices in the Old Testament were looking forward to the one who would be the ultimate sacrifice, which is Jesus. The sacrifices in the millennial period will be looking back to what Christ has done on the cross. And, and, and they will be sacrifices of worship unto the Lord, not sacrifices of atonement. Because, you know, he died once and for all for, for the sins of the world. And, and so that's what Hebrews reminds us. There's no other sacrifice for sins necessary. And the Bible doesn't say that there will be sacrifices happening in the New heaven, new earth. No. It's it, only millennium. Yeah, only in the millennial period. Yeah, that's true. Which there will be a temple as well. It, exactly. In the millennial period, in the millennial not, in the period. New, not in the new Jerusalem. Correct. Here's a good one. That right. just, no one can really answer it. But is all of eternity spent inside the new Jerusalem, or can we come and go and visit the rest of the universe? Yeah, I, I got... Uh, I got a similar question like that in someone else who had, who had uh, written in earlier. Um, again, yeah, we can't answer it. But like, I don't know that I would have any desire to leave. Why not? I mean, why would you want to? Visit the planets. Well, there's no reference that there will be any other planets because the moon's going to go away and the sun's going to go away. So I don't even know if there will be stars or other planets. It's a whole new thing that we can't even imagine. But, you know, think about the most wonderful place on Earth, and I'm not talking Disney World, but that you would, that you would ever want to go or be. And if you love it that much, you never really want to leave. And I, I just can't imagine how wonderful it's going to be around Jesus. I don't, I don't think I want to, like, take off and go somewhere else. That's true. You yeah. can. <laughs> if you're there. I mean, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> wow. I'm done. I don't know. <laughs> um, I had, there was a good question. Um, All right, while you're looking for that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer one because somebody asked about Matthew 24, the parable of the fig tree. Um, some people take Jesus talking about the fig tree in Matthew 24 to mean Israel and its rebirth as a nation. They take the, this generation will not pass away to mean the generation of people that are alive after Israel's rebirth in 1948. And they define a generation by Psalm 90 verse 10, which talks about 70 or 80 years. Do you believe there is validity to this fig tree generation concept? Well, so... Um, didn't Israel already um, celebrated their 70th anniversary, right? Yeah. 19, my math is terrible, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they're already, so, <laughs> this, in, in Psalm 90, verse 10, it talks about the days of, the, of a man are 70 years, and if he has health till 80, and is that the definition of a generation? Um, I, I, not necessarily, but let me, let me take you to the actual text and then, and then comment. In Matthew 24, 32, Jesus says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you that this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. I do believe that the budding of the fig tree 
is symbolic of the rebirth of the nation of Israel. So I, I would agree the person's question is about, you know, Israel 1948, but does that start the clock, meaning that one full generation, so let's say 80 years from 1948 is going to be when Jesus returns? Can we, can we define his return based on that? Um, I, I don't think that that, that speaks of a generation, uh, Psalm 90, verse 10. I think that speaks of a, of a man's, uh, I mean that generically, man, woman's lifetime, lifespan. Uh, typically, a generation in the Bible was 40 years. But that said, when Jesus says, Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. You know, he's speaking to the people of his day. Well, obviously, Jesus didn't return during the lifetime of that generation. So he couldn't have meant the people of that day. The Greek word for generation there in that verse is ethnos. Again, it's the same word. It means ethnic linguistic people. They can also be translated race of people. And so there's two ways to interpret what Jesus means. Either he means, number one, that he's referring to the race of the Jews. That despite the fact that the Jews will be a persecuted people, the race of the Jewish people will not pass away from the planet before the return of the Lord. That's very plausible. There's another interpretation, number two, that he simply means this generation. And when you look at Matthew 24, and a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday morning, I went through the whole chapter. Um, he speaks about the signs of the times, all these events that are going to start to happen closer to the return of Christ. And it's possible that he means this generation that witnesses all of these end time events surely will not pass away before the coming of the Lord. And you can take your pick. I, th I think either one works. Either he refers to the Jewish race that won't pass away. He will preserve the Jewish people until the end. Or he could mean simply the generation that experiences the flood of events in Matthew chapter 24 will not pass away before his second coming. What you got there? You still want me to answer? Well, if, yeah, if you can. Go yeah, because apparently I'm not going to heaven. So. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'm praying for you still. Thanks. All right. Can you explain the Bema seat judgment? Are all born again Christians subject to this judgment? So it's, it's a reference to Matthew 25, and the word Bema is not in the Bible except in the, in the, in the Greek. Um, I think it's a reference to when. Christians receive um, their rewards. I don't, I don't believe it is a judgment. What was the rest of the question? Are all born again Christians subject to this judgment? Yeah, but it's not a judgment of salvation. It's a judgment of reward because, listen, and I, and I, and I just want to put to rest people who have this fear. I, I hear time and time again people say, well, I accepted Jesus, but I hope I make it through the, the, the judgment. Like when I stand before him, and, he, and, and I, I can tell you, as a kid, I, I mentioned this before, you know, um, either I didn't understand it or the denomination stream that I grew up in made it come across like you need to accept Jesus, but then what, you're going to stand before him one day and they're going to have a big jumbotron and they're going to replay your whole life. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? And they're going to replay everything you've ever done, said, or thought. And, and then, you know, hopefully you're still good to go. And, and so that was the kind of the fear, of God, the literal fear of God that was put in me. Like, you know, I know I've accepted Jesus, but on that day when they have to see everything I've ever said, thought, or done, you know, I hope I still make it. Listen, when you receive Christ as your Savior, you pass from death to life. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And so, you, when you make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, your sins are, are forgiven and forgotten as far as the East is from the West. God does not revisit them. But you stand before the Lord, He's like, yeah, I know I died on the cross for those sins, but we're going to take a look at them one more time. <laughs> That's not going to happen. So, the judgment of the Bema seat is, is a judgment time when your works are going to be rewarded. And again, I mentioned this on Sunday, works don't get us saved, but God has already said that He will reward those. It's, it's one of the last things He mentions in Revelation chapter 22, when I return, my reward is with me, and to reward everyone according to His works. And so, God delights to reward us for the good things that we do for His glory. 
At the same time, the Bible talks about in Revelation that, you know, in his presence, we will cast our crowns and lay them at his feet. So whatever wonderful rewards you and I get, we're going to feel so undone in his presence that they're going to be coming down. You know, our crowns are going to be coming down. Nobody's going to be walking around with a really heavy crown, you know, and others are going to be like, whoa, I only got the paper one. Wow. Because whatever crown you get, you're casting it down at his feet. We are going to be so undone in his presence. You know, Isaiah, when he caught a glimpse of Jesus, you know, the throne of God in in Isaiah 6, he says, woe is me because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And and he just was undone in the presence of the Lord. And so um, I think that that is a reference to the rewards we get, which we end up just laying at his feet anyhow. And it's different from the great white throne yes, judgment, is. which is in Revelation 20, and that's for unbelievers. Correct. Um, and that is after the millennial kingdom. Yeah. Um, here's an interesting question, too. I want to get your thoughts on this. If uh, Revelation 17 talks about an act of commerce when Babylon falls. Mm-hmm. Um, John talks about it as a mystery Babylon, and this individual says it's hard to understand given that earlier chapters in Revelation discuss disasters like sea turning to blood, d- demonic creatures killing millions of people, how do you reconcile the two um, when Revelation 17 appears there and talks about this act of commerce? Yeah, like what kind of commerce will be left after so much of the planet is on fire and destroyed? Right. Right. Yeah, it's a good question, but, but one of the things that we see, and this might be something that I get into with Dr. Heinsohn next week, because he takes a different position on Babylon than I do. Um, I, I see Babylon as a literal ancient city that gets revived as to a, the capital center of commerce and, and religion. Um, and I can let him explain his view better than I'm gonna say it, but he basically sees Babylon as symbolic and not as a literal uh, city that gets re- revived. But based on, on what I just said I, about my interpretation, um, I, there's a rebuilding and a revival. And the same time that there's this cataclysmic stuff that happens on the planet, there's also a rebuilding and a revival. And uh, so I think commerce uh, begins to be revived again under the leadership of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. and this one world government, and then that's chapter 17, and then chapter 18 is basically one world religion. So you have this political slash commercial empire that is gonna be global, and you have a religious um, one world religion that that is global. And so both of these things rise again out of the ashes, and then it will be collapsed, it will be destroyed again, but there's some amount of revival in the midst of all the calamity as best as I can see through Revelation. But it's a good question because a lot of it gets destroyed, especially the shipping industry gets, gets destroyed a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I've read somewhere interesting that the Antichrist, if Babylon is the literal Babylon resurrected in Iraq, that he would make his headquarters there. Yeah. And there's been always talks briefly of the UN even moving there. Uh, yeah. They've been talking about that for a while. They have been. And that halfway in, the Antichrist will move to Jerusalem and make his headquarters there, and that's when he declares himself to be God in the temple. Um, yeah. And so there's a, might be both, that he has headquarters in Babylon and in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. We have time for maybe one more? Yeah. What you got? Um, yeah, this is a good one. In Revelation, um, I think they mean 21. When it refers to adding or subtracting from this book, is it referring to the whole Bible or just the book of Revelation? It's, 20, it's 22. Um, and uh, it, the last part, verse 18, for I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Um, it, it seems that it's speaking primarily about the book of Revelation, but I certainly think that when you look at just the whole you know, principle, um, while the context might mean the book of Revelation as John was inspired to write it, I think the principle is you don't mess with any of God's word. Mm-hmm. You don't add to it, um, that's legalism. You don't remove anything from it. That's liberalism. We have both streams, unfortunately, 
in the, in the church today. I mean, our church, we, we try to guard ourselves against that kind of thing. But in some churches, they have a very legalistic bent where they kind of add rules and regulations even more than what God says. That's legalism. That's adding to it. And you have this convenient removal, like the Bible just, you know, ends up looking like Swiss cheese with a bunch of holes in it because we don't like this part, so we're going to take that out. We don't like this, so we're not going to reference that. And that's liberalism. That's when you adopt the Word of God to suit your own culture and lifestyle. But the Bible is quite the opposite. We are supposed to adjust the culture and our lifestyle to what the Bible says as the standard. And so um, I think it's a little bit of both. Here's one from a seven-year-old. All right, we'll end with this one. Um, they actually how, say they're seven years old yeah. in the question? Okay. How is the earth going to be destroyed? By torch or lava? <laughs> by God's big torch. It's called global warming. <laughs> It's the real global warming, friends. It's the real global warming. Yeah, go green because it's all going to go in smoke. That's what it's all going to go. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll get a lot of emails now again because I... Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. That's not your fault. It's mine. I, I always invite my own emails. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's a good question from a seven-year-old. Yeah. But the good news is to the seven-year-old who asked it that... God is making a new heaven and a new earth, which will be the home for us for eternity in his presence. So this one goes away, but God takes care of us and gives us a new heaven and a new earth. All right, let me pray. And then uh, we'll we'll continue again along the same theme on Sunday mornings. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 25. We're going to look at the parable of the 10 virgins. And it has to do with the return of Christ. And then next Wednesday night, Dr. Heinsohn will be with us. So I'm looking forward to that time. Encourage you to be with us then as well. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time in your word together and in your house. We just love you. We thank you that you first loved us and gave your son Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins. And he is our hope, Lord. You are our hope. That you loved us. You died for us on a cross to redeem us from our sins. And that you're coming again. And so we look forward to that day whenever it is, Lord. We don't presume to put a date on it, but we look at the signs of the times and we realize we're getting closer. We're getting closer. So we pray that our hearts would be ready. We pray for our loved ones and our friends who don't know you, that you would move in their hearts and that you would bring people into their lives if we're not able to be a voice that they'll listen to. And often that's the case. Sometimes the people we're closest to don't, take us seriously or they don't want to hear what we have to say. But Lord, you can bring others into their lives who will speak truth so that those we love and care about will come to know you as Lord and Savior. Move in their hearts, Father. We know that your heart is you want none to perish but all to come to repentance. So we pray for that, Lord. Move among them, we pray. Draw people close to yourself. And we love you and praise you together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you all.